Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Our Universe Revealed, which is the public lecture series from the Department of Physics at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Jonathan Crass, and I am the coordinator for, coordinator for the series. It's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening, whether you're joining us for the first time or whether you're back with us again. Welcome to the series. As always, if you do want to know more about the series, you can find that on information online at our website, nduniverse.org, where you can also sign up to our mailing lists or visit uh, our group on Facebook, where you can also find out information about our events as well. Um, as we've done for our online talks so far, we're going to continue with the same format. Um, we'll have a presentation from our speaker this evening, followed by some questions. You can submit your questions at any time using a questionnaire, either using the Q&A functionality in Zoom at the bottom of your screen, or if you're watching on YouTube, there's a chat window on the right hand side you can also use. And we also have a Google form that you're able to submit your questions to as well. And I've just sent the link to that out in both the YouTube chat as well as in the Zoom chat. So feel free to use any of those platforms We'll collect those questions all the way through the talk, so feel free to submit them at any time, and then we'll deal with them at the end, and I'll ask some questions to our speaker this evening. It is my pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Graham Peasley back to our universe revealed. Um, Graham is a professor of experimental nuclear physics here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and for those of you who've attended our previous in-person events, he's presented to us on several topics over the past couple of years in conjunction with other faculty and students at the university. Um, the, he's talked on topics that are focused on sort of the applied aspect of nuclear physics, including addressing environmental lead in South Bend to fluorinated chemicals in fast food packaging and their impact. And tonight he's gonna to talk to us about one of his current research programs, and that relates to PFAS and its impact on firefighters and their protective equipment, the human body and the environment. And um, for those of you who are Notre Dame football fans, if you've ever watched the halftime commercials during home games, um, you might have seen Graham this in 2019 as part of the What Would You Fight For series, which highlights research being done at the university. Um, his work on PFAS was featured in that in a video titled What Would You Fight For? in the What We Would Fight was series. So he was to, to sort of working in that and he highlighted there. And that's the work that he's gonna talk about this evening. So it's my pleasure to welcome Graham tonight. And thank you very much for offering to speak to us. Let's see if we can get this screen sharing working. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. You would like me to share my screen at this point, right? If you could, that would be great. Uh, I think we can work on that. <laughs> or else we're gonna do hand puppets. There you go. <laughs> And uh, I will start the presentation from there. And are you able to see my screen? Yep, that looks good to me. Very good. We'll Over take off. At, I'll sleep for the next three and a half hours, I think, is, uh, is the ground rules. Is that right? A little bit Something shorter. Like that. I'll try to make it a little bit shorter. There you go. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in. I understand this is a whole new world we're living in, but being able to give a talk virtually means you missed the 32 degrees and light snow we had a couple hours ago here. Uh, and I hope you're in warmer places. Um, my talk tonight is about PFAS, which is a topic I like talking about a lot, and specifically about firefighters and how they're at sort of the point, uh, both in terms of the COVID response, but also in terms of this, this issue of PFAS and our environmental and occupational exposure to it. So I'd be happy to sort of give you an outline of what I'll talk about. I'm gonna talk, talk a couple minutes about what PFAS are. I know that many people already listening know it very well, uh, but it's something that nobody had heard about a short while ago and now everybody's heard about it. And so I'd like to sort of bring us all up to the same level as to what these chemicals are and why I'm concerned by them. And then uh, what are the environmental sources for both us and the firefighters and where are the threats and what do they need to do to address them? And I'll have time hopefully for some questions at the end. I'll speak rapidly because there'll be no questions during the talk. Uh, I usually like conversing with my audience and seeing if they're awake. At this point, you can go to the fridge and, and, and sleep through it, but I will try to uh, stay on task and then uh, answer all the questions at the end. So PFAS is a short uh, acronym for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Um, they were invented around World War II. All of them are man-made. They refer to a, a category of about 4,700 of these things. 
And they used to be called organofluorines or fluorinated compounds, PFCs. And in about 2012, we started all calling them PFAS because that's a better name for them. Uh, industry itself defines it as that. Um, they have amazing properties and there's a, all sorts of YouTube videos you could link into, but here's the one of the two guys in, in shirts. One of them has been treated by PFAS and one of them has not. And then somebody threw mud at them. If you can find all sorts of amazing properties, surfactant properties of these things on textiles, carpets, papers, paints, cosmetics, actually everything. We use this in anywhere that you want a water-free or oil-free surface and or as a solvent for various types of materials. And it is widely used. Um, the reason it's so important or the reason it's so good at what it does is its structure. There's about 4,800 uh, ones with CAS numbers. <clears throat> That's a way of identifying whether a chemical has been manufactured or not. And they all have carbon fluorine bonds, as indicated by the gray and green bond on these molecular diagrams here, just a few of them. I know the names of the first hundred or two, but after that, uh, even I have to look up the names because I don't know what they are. Uh, but these are the more common ones you'll see floating around the newspaper, certainly. And there are things like PFOR and PFOS, <clears throat> which have an N group, which is polar, and then this carbon fluorine bond structure, an alkyl substance that is very nonpolar. And that gives it pretty amazing properties. Uh, the carbon fluorine bond on the right is shown as the highest bond energy in the periodic table, which means that it's hard to break. Um, nothing will break it naturally in the environment unless you get high temperature or lightning or something of that order. Um, the uh, action it takes is like all surfactants, it surrounds, uh, it really doesn't like being in water, so it layers the surface of the water and the tails will stick out of the water and the heads will stick in. Or if there's dirt in the substance, this is why we use soaps. They, they surround the dirt and they make them soluble in water because they're uh, typically oil and uh, non-water soluble. Um, they use them in everything, in non-stick coatings, as obviously the Teflon. You'd use it in carpets to make Scotch guard or in coats to make Gore-Tex, where these things will repel water, be water resistant, and of course, microwave popcorn. Why wouldn't you use it in a paper packaging? In the first, when you take microwave popcorn out of the oven, you cut it open, what's the first thing you see? It's of course water, steam. And if you were a good chemist, would you put steam in a paper bag? Probably not, uh, not your first choice. But they do it because it can be coated with PFAS on the inside and that keeps the steam in and the butter uh, from uh, wicking through the paper and, and turn it into a soggy mess. Um, of course, then you heat it to 200 degrees and eat it, probably not the best place to put your artificial chemical. Uh, and of course, firefighting foams has gotten in the news a lot recently. And we'll go into why that is. What is the problem? We've got this wonderful chemical, it's uh, better living through chemistry and all that sort of good stuff. But there is a problem in the fact that these carbon fluorine bonds are so hard to break. That they have lifetimes in the hundreds of thousands of years even. Uh, nothing eats them naturally because you don't get any energy from breaking that bond. They have no biotic or abiotic degradation pathways is the official way to say that. And so they're called the forever chemicals. They last in the environment for a very long time. Um, and they're widely used. So the military use of this foam has persisted from 1969 to now, uh, which is uh, approaching 50 years of use. And it used to be used daily on every aircraft carrier in the, in the, in the uh, Navy, um, and that's a Navy website photo that's since been taken down after they used the foam, it went into the oceans. Um, and this has an issue because of its environmental persistence. Uh, this is a nice diagram from somebody else's paper where they showed that you can produce it from a Teflon manufacturing site where it's being used into making materials, and that material gets into your house, or it could be uh, uh, excluded, uh, extruded out through the effluent into the river water or groundwater people in Cape Fear, uh, uh, North Carolina certainly know well about that now because they live downstream from a DuPont plant that put this thing in their water supply. Or it could go into biosolids and from the wastewater treatment plant passes right through and gets into the, the soils that the crops are grown into or the water that irrigates those crops. And you're either drinking it or eating it or wearing it. And there are all methods of getting them into you. The drinking water situation in the U.S. is such that uh, this was already in 2016. We've identified six million people that might be drinking above the health advisory limit, um, and that's in these areas in the pink, in the as opposed to the gray areas, which didn't. 
But that was at a very early stage without good data. And the answer may be, it may be considerably higher, maybe 10 times higher than that in the US. If you can imagine 50 or 60 million people drinking this material above uh, EPA regulated limit, um, that's, that gets to be scary in terms of public health concerns. It bioaccumulates, it biomagnifies. These are wonderful terms where a smaller fish will be eaten by a larger fish, will be eaten by a seal, will be eaten by a polar bear. And this is why you see this paper about the PFAS being detected in polar bear blood. And it makes you realize that all that foam agent that we put in the oceans may not have been uh, the end of where we saw the foam. It's our manufacturing and use of it that gets it into the predators in the Northern and South Pole. Uh, and of course, the biggest predator at the top of the food chain in the mid latitudes is Americans. So in North Americans, each of us has about five parts per billion of PFOA, uh, of PFAS in general in our blood uh, combination, PFO and PFOS in this case, um, that are in our blood, um, courtesy of our of ubiquitous use of this, and we've all ingested some of it. Um, there are disease correlations. So not only is it persistent, uh, bioaccumulative, but it is also toxic. Uh, <clears throat> there are 4,700, and the toxicity results have not been done on all of them yet. But we know two of them that were very well studied, um, PFO and PFOS. <clears throat> the CA chains. Um, and we know that because there was a little oopsies at a DuPont plant in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, where they poisoned a town with Little Hawking uh, with downstream. And 69,000 people got their blood tested as a result of a, a settlement there. And there were six diseases found correlated uh, unambiguously with uh, that type of epidemiological, probably the largest epidemiological uh, data uh, study ever done. And the company thought it was getting away with it, but uh, when that many people signed up to be tested, then you had some statistics to prove even two types of cancer and these hypertension and ulcerative uh, colitis, uh, immune diseases, um, and this uh, high cholesterol hypertension and preeclampsia, which is uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. So these diseases were correlated with a known population, uh, led to lawsuits and all sorts of settlements. Um, and the number of health publications has just skyrocketed over the last two decades, where other things have shown up besides uh, liver malfunction and obesity and uh, low birth weight uh, babies and immune system reduction. That's a pretty scary one, actually, the fact that if you reduce the immune system by ingesting some of these chemicals, any opportunistic disease can take part. So prostate cancer is not directly associated with it, but if you have a genetic predisposition in your family towards it, this could, for example, allow that to express itself more quickly because your immune system is reduced. Those types of uh, correlations are very scary. Uh, and there's a lot of publications coming out, but of course we don't know which chemical causes what, and it's very hard to say unless you have large statistical populations. Um, there's some pushes to what was being regulated. We've talked a lot about PFO or PFOS up till now, and those are, have got six carbon chains in the, in the six carbons in their chain which are shown here on the C8 category. There are longer ones, C10s and C9s, but there are also shorter ones, C4s and C6s. And the reason we do the even ones is that the manufacturing process tended to favor the even ones, the certain type of processing, though there are odd ones as well. Uh, and more recently, there are more of them. Um, and so when this disease correlation was found in 2012, the companies in the US that manufactured these chemicals decided to phase out that very profitable industry. But they switched simply to C6, which they had ready to go. And that means there are six chains. And indeed, this environmental persistence is less. It's um, uh, less in the environment, but it is also you need more of it to actually perform the same function. So it's a bit of a trade off. And in the human body, it's actually not that much less. It's still years. Uh, if you go down to C4, it does get shorter, but uh, being less uh, in your body, but being more of it, there's a trade-off as to what the effects of these things are. And my question is, does it really matter? And here's my first interactive uh, slide where I ask, which one is which? You can see these two chemicals and they're both sulfonates, I'll tell you that, but can you tell quickly which is a C8 and a C6? And really does it matter? There's the answer, the ones, if you count them, have more on the left and the right. But for all intents and purposes, we treat these as a class of chemicals for good reason. They have very similar properties with very similar end groups. And yes, the polymers are different, but uh, in terms of whether they switch from a C8 to a C6, there's a real regrettable substitution that I think has gone on there. And I don't think it's going to help us. Um, we have evidence now from a published paper that uh, when you 
uh, put these uh, compounds into a rat, or a mouse in fact, that we did a mouse study, and we really labeled them to be C8, C6, and C4, you saw the distribution change depending on where they went, uh, but they went to every organ in the mouse. Uh, they carried, they typically bind to blood uh, proteins and they get carried to every organ. And what you may have done is reduce the liver exposure to C8 uh, by C6, but you may have increased the brain exposure, for example. And that would be what we call a regrettable substitution. Um, a little bit about why I'm involved in that as a physicist, why am I studying chemistry? Well, it's interesting and it has a, an impact, but more importantly, we have a technique by which we can measure the fluorine that's there. And this is the Nuclear Science Lab at Notre Dame with not one, but four active accelerators, three of them shown here and one in South Dakota, which is a long story. Um, and in September 2016, this third accelerator was, was installed at the building, uh, which is the one that we use called the St. Andre Pelotron. Um, it, was, it became operational in 2018 when I moved my research program here. And we use this relatively low energy accelerator to measure, and this is how uh, ion so, uh, uh, Van de Graaff accelerators work, electrostatic accelerators. These are the ones you stick your hands on and your hair stands up. Uh, so it's a charging belt that puts a few million volts into the middle of this tank, um, which is carefully grounded so it doesn't touch the students around it. That's, that's healthy. Um, and you can inject ions into it and accelerate them out to several millions of electron volts. This gives you enough energy to break some of those bonds we talked about, but more importantly, it gives you, and here's an example of the inside of our accelerator. There's some smiling physicists around it. Um, and uh, an ion source that will produce hydrogen and helium in our cases. It's a very stable modification of a, of a commercial ion source that produces H pluses, in our case, protons. Um, and we inject them into our accelerator. There's a overhead diagram of it with some students smiling at the camera, uh, but we will, in fact, uh, bring those accelerated particles out now moving at one or two percent the speed of light onto a target wheel. And there in February is where our first beam came out. Um, and we got it to go about six or eight inches into air. And the clever thing we've done with it is we, we brought the beam out into air so we don't have to put the samples in vacuum. And that allows me to put this big target wheel shown on the right, which rotates with all our samples on it. And we can run each sample for one to three minutes as ne necessary and take a look at what happens with the interaction of this beam onto our sample. And those samples can be any solid matrix that we look at. And there's a nuclear reaction that takes place that will give us a spectrum uh, described in these two publications here, for example, the, the method technique, um, the, that shows what happens when I put a popcorn bag in red in front of the beam versus a, a copy of paper, which is typically not fluorinated. And you see instantly these two gamma rays that come out and it's called particle induced gamma ray emission because it's a nuclear process that if you excite the, the nucleus, the fluorine nucleus, uh, then you get a very distinctive signature. Nothing else as you can see the background is very close to negligible in this, in this spectrum. So there's no interference and there's no other matrix effects that you can get, it's gamma rays, they go several feet in air, no problem. And so this is a, a clean nuclear signature of when fluorine is present. So with that little physics lesson, uh, we can do a couple more slides on it. Here's a, uh, the two that we do most commonly, uh, X-ray emission and gamma ray emission. And that this, the idea is from uh, excitation, if you put a, a, an accelerated particle onto an atomic shell, you'll excite the electrons and create X-rays. But if you put it right onto the nucleus, and occasionally one of them hits the nucleus, or at least glances off it, you'll get this nuclear excitation that gives you gamma rays. And those gamma rays are very characteristic of which nucleus you hit. So if you hit anything else in the periodic table, it'll give you different energies, but certainly not the ones that are associated with fluorine. And the spectra, many of you know the chemistry, atomic diagrams of the Ls, we call them Ks, Ls, and Ms, but the N equal one shell and N equal two shell and N equal three shell in chemistry, the same sort of shells exist in nuclei. And so that you have transitions that are, and that's the fluorine transition shown there on the right, have been well studied since the 1950s, everybody knows what they are, so that there's, there's no ambiguity that what we detect is fluorine. Um, and then you get these wonderful spectra out. Uh, the students do all the work. I simply uh, get the samples collected and uh, through a lot of volunteers. And we publish papers such as this one, which was one of the biggest papers we put out on simply the observation in the consumer products of this fluorinated coating being used on fast food wrappers. And we didn't know quite how viral this would go. But this with 26,000 downloads in two years simply because 300 news articles covered it 
Uh, and it was discovered that McDonald's and Burger King and Panera and all these wonderful chains would be using these, these coated papers to keep the wax, to remove the wax paper and, and go with this coated paper. That was the best surfactant known. It kept the oil on one side and the water uh, separate from your pants. Um, unfortunately, they didn't realize that when people discovered that you used a persistent and bioaccumulative and toxic chemical on your food wrappers, people may not like it so much. And all of these companies responded very quickly and removed it from their wrappers in the following year, I'm told. And to the best of my knowledge, that's what's happened. Not all companies got the memo, but the ones that were mentioned on this article certainly did. And they, um, it was an evidence of, of science actually changing policy. And the reason was that there was a cheaper alternative available. It just didn't work as well, but the companies don't want any, they don't sell wrappers, they sell the food and they're interested in their brand image and, and not worry about lawsuits in the future. So this seemed to me to be a very powerful way to use science to drive policy and just educate consumers about what they're exposed to. So now I'd like to get back to the question of firefighters and I've done a little introduction, but everybody knows the first responders and their, and their position of what they do. Um, and we talked about firefighting foam specifically. And so firefighting foam is indeed one of the major sources that firefighters are exposed to PFAS. Um, it's used at airports. Uh, military firefighters use it every day on every airport that they own because they practice every day. Municipal airports do not. Uh, this all ceased a couple of years ago uh, when the rules came down saying, Ooh, maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, but more importantly, it's the release from those airports that gets it into the groundwater of the surrounding communities. So not just the firefighters, but their communities are being exposed from the use of the AFFF foam. There's industrial release uh, from manufacturing sites like DuPont and Camorra's now, uh, 3M, that have historically made something, uh, the, the San Germain up at the, um, uh, Hoosick Falls was the last newspaper one with a material release. Um, there's consumer products that can also release these things, uh, especially those that are now piling up in the landfills and the what's called wastewater treatment plants here. Those will, ex uh, the, the PFAS will come off the fast food wrapper. I don't really care about them being on the fast food wrapper because I don't eat the wrapper. But what happens to the wrapper after you're done with the food is you throw it in the trash or the compost. And in either case, the paper will break down in about 60 days aerobically. And that means 100% of the chemicals that were applied to that will come off into the environment and persist for the next thousand years into your drinking water or your agricultural biosolids and things like that. And so it's a much bigger problem than just the food wrapper. And I'm trying to bring that now back to a segment of the population that's exposed and are finding out about it in the, in the, in the wrong way. Um, this is an example from the Environmental Working Group. It's a, a nonprofit that uh, brings, uh, sounds the alarm when they find things like this in the environment. And these are the sites in North America from the end of 2019, divided into military sites and drinking water sites, because uh, we started to study drinking waters. If you look very carefully at Michigan, it's got measles. Um, and the reason is Michigan is one of the states that began to study it. And it's the only one that studied the drinking water uh, at this time, though New Jersey had done some before, as you can tell. Um, and uh, there are of the order of 2,300 US uh, military bases in this country, uh, both if you can include the historical ones and the active ones. Um, and I'm afraid that many of them, if not all, may have this problem because of the use of these chemicals. We've written papers as a group of, of scientists sort of saying, you know, we're not advocating to ban anything. If you're going to take, you know, uh, hike up to top of Mount Everest, you probably want the best water breathing agent on your coat. Or if you send a satellite to Pluto and beyond, you want the lubricant to keep working in 30 years in space, then it better be a fluoropolymer. That's what you're going to use uh, uh, surfactant. But if you were to go to the mall, does it need to be as waterproof? Or if you are using microwave popcorn, there are fluorine-free bags, so they're more expensive. Um, I'm, I'm going to vote for that or eat popcorn the old-fashioned way. It's good for you. Um, and so we write policy papers and we start doing more studies on where this chemical may be. And with a rapid screening technique like Piggy that we've developed here, we have a way of looking at lots of materials. And I'd like to look at the class B foams, which is the designation of the foams used for petrochemical use for firefighting. And they're very good because they are designed to go on the interface between water and fuel, for example and that fuel will be smothered uh, by uh, a, a layer of a film 
that will not let the water pass in and disperse the burning fuel and it will keep the oxygen as the, as the foam bubbles, uh, it'll prevent the oxygen from getting to the source of the ignition and it will extinguish fires quicker than not. So if you're on a burning airplane, this is a very good foam to use. There are lots of arguments that nothing else could do as well. Well, yes and no, nobody tried after doing this because there was no motivation. But if you discovered that there was a toxicity associated with using this foam and certainly putting it in the environment um, and for hundreds of years and having people drink it, then there's been a recent rash of new film foams developed and some of them work as well as this uh, AFFF uh, class B foams that was the king of the pile for 30 years in there or 40 years now um, because they have didn't try to really compete. And there are some situations where it still may not be as good, but in most cases, there are fluorine free foams now available, but only in the last year or two and mostly developed in Europe recently. Um, and examples of the firefighter use, this is a, a military firefighter wearing the silvers, um, but after a hangar suppression accident, they put all this foam all over the hangar to put out a fire rapidly. They had to clear it up and you can tell it was a warm day in California. And so he got the blower out and started blowing this stuff around. But if you were to think about that as a hazardous chemical, such as one that causes cancer, would this be the type of gear that you'd use to do that? Um, this is a historical photo from 2013 or so. Um, similarly, we've discovered the hard way up in, uh, in uh, Oscoda, Michigan, there's a closed Air Force base, closed in 1993 actually, uh, but it was on the edge of a little lake there called Van Etten Lake. You can see the, uh, the top right of the, of the Air Force base from the side. And two winters ago, the winter before this last, um, it didn't freeze over. Uh, it usually freezes over in, by January, but they had a big storm in January and all this foam started to blow up on the shore, which wasn't snow, it was actual foam. And it came from groundwater that had been laden with PFAS that reconstituted into firefighting foam as the wind whipped the waves. And that's probably not good. And so the residents were advised to wear gloves when handling it, um, <clears throat> or not to handle it at all, in fact. And the community that lived around the Air Force Base was now considerably smaller than when the Air Force Base was active, but it is strongly impacted by its drinking water, as well water there. And so they're drinking this material. Um, and just as an overlay, this is a, a Air Force study of the various plumes coming off the Air Force Base. And there's at least 35 separate areas where PFAS is reused, including a couple of airplane crashes, but also the fire training area and all fire training area and the hangar suppression systems and the wastewater treatment plants, and et cetera, and so forth. And all of these <clears throat> leak into the environment, which in this case is a small community, but could easily be larger. And then there are many cases such as Cape Fear, North Carolina, and Venice, Italy, where this is a much larger area that got exposed. Um, so what else could go wrong with AFFF? And this is, um, it's been used for many years and works pretty well. So why would we want to remove it? And this is an incident that happened uh, last summer in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, where a transformer caught fire, in fact, two of them, I believe, um, and they burned and they're filled with these wonderful petrochemicals that keep the, the insulators working on transformers. And the fire department was called. I think it was a, at least a two alarm fire. A couple of fire companies had to respond to put this thing out. And as it's burning flammable liquids, they used class B foams to smother the flames. And they used up quite a bit of it uh, to put these flames out. And they got it put out um, very successfully. And unfortunately, they ended up on the wrong side of the newspaper article because it's right next to Lake Mendota, which is the, the Lake Monona, I'm sorry. Uh, this is shown in the uh, foreground of that photograph, right next to the transformer fires and the foam washed off because nobody told them that the foam was going to contaminate a lake. Um, there was simply an observation. Somebody tested the fish the next week and found that the, the, river, the lake had to be closed to fishing because the fish had all accumulated too much of the PFAS that they shouldn't be eaten. Um, and this is downtown in a major metropolitan city where a lot of people fished. Um, and it got on the bad side of a whole bunch of uh, newspaper reports. And the fire department, you know, was literally caught off guard because they had done what they were told to do to put out a fire in a pretty timely manner, no less. Yet they got accused of poisoning the environment and poisoning the public which they serve. And that's not good for anybody. And the fire department actually had a chief that took hold of the situation and said, okay, we're going to not use this if it causes an environmental hazard and, and, and poisons people. And so they went to a pre-pass free alternative. And uh, Chief Davis, who's the person who did this, replaced uh, something of the order of 29 trucks worth of, of firefighting foam 
and uh, the storage of the material, uh, the buckets of material that they put into this, these tanker trucks um, for a cost of about $40,000, he had to replace that. And then he had to uh, buy a new foam for another $40,000. Uh, so it cost him $80,000 out of his pocket, which they didn't have expenses to do, but he felt it was the right thing to do in Wisconsin. And together with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, they have now decided to address all 750 fire districts in Wisconsin, for which there are uh, dozens of firehouses and of course, pieces of equipment that have this foam in them. And they're going to try to buy back all the fluorine foam and just switch entirely to fluorine free foam. And many of the fire departments in Wisconsin are in the middle of doing this. Um, it was unfortunate that they had to be shamed into doing that by, by the, uh, the newspaper reports, but they didn't know that nobody had told them about the psychological hazard. They were told the new foams were safer. Uh, well, safer is an is a adjective that a company can use to describe its product, but it doesn't mean that it's environmentally harmless, and in this case, it clearly wasn't. Um, there are fluorine-free phones commercially available, and the uh, uh, municipal fire departments are switching. Even in Elkhart, Indiana, all three of their trucks are now on fluorine-free phones. Um, there is some pushback. Um, they, phone manufacturers don't want to switch necessarily, at least not without warning. But it's actually going much wider than that. The new National Defense Authorization Act has said that the entire military complex, which uses about 60% of the foam sold, is going to go to fluorine free or cease all PFAS based use by 2022. And in, as far as I can count, the state of Michigan and the state of Wisconsin, both by reasons of really embarrassing newspaper stories about uh, PFAS contamination, have now begun programs to remove the foam from the municipal fire departments. I'd say there's about 48 states left to go, and there's gonna be a lot of discussion amongst the fire services about what's a good alternative phone to use, what's its cost, and who's gonna pay for the disposal of the old waste, because you have some issues left to go. This is actually good that the fire departments are being made aware of this and are responding in a very appropriate manner most of the time. But um, the actual firefighter on the ground, <coughs> me, still hasn't necessarily been trained when to use the phone and when not to use the phone. Um, it should be used on a petrochemical spill, for example, but uh, if it's PFAS based, you'll want a containment system. And the state of Wisconsin has now defined uh, a use of class B phones as a hazmat instrument because it might save a life in a, in a, in a rare situation, but it may also um, contaminate a very large area if it isn't contained. And that leads to a lot of paperwork and an expense. So the fluorine free phones are clearly the way that the, uh, the fire services will go. And there's a photograph on the right taken off a website uh, that shows that the fire chief there or somebody in Pennsylvania made the decision that, well, we have all this stuff, we'll just get rid of it in the backyard and they practiced with it all night and it was gone by the morning. But that's probably not what you wanna do. You'd like to dispose of it as hazardous waste where it's taken away and incinerated or buried such that you don't get it back into the environment. And so trying to prevent that means that there are um, education uh, initiatives that we're trying to do with the fire services. Uh, we're trying to get them out of being on the front page in a bad way and trying to get them to avoid this sort of um, negative publicity. But it's very hard to do because they just recently, uh, five years ago, went through a switch from the C8 based phone to the C6 based phone. And look at the little logos that came with it, these wonderful green, this is a nice stewardship award because they were greener and safer chemicals. But in fact, those weren't PFOA, and they listed there as being PFOS and PFOA free. Those are the two C8 compounds. And yes, this new foam had no C8, in it, but it had twice as much C6, or sometimes three times as much. And so that means, and that C6 is more soluble, it gets further. Um, and there are certainly harmful effects from C6 in the body as well as C8. They might be different ones, uh, and we haven't got them as well established as the C8s. But there are all the literature coming out now shows that they are also have their various levels of toxicity. They're all known to have some immune suppression, for example, and things like that. So it's very confusing to the average consumer, in this case, the fire services. Well, I got this nice certificate saying it's safer. Is it? It's not got PFOA in it. Well, then you get the acronym SOUP. Is PFAS the same as PFOS? No, PFOS is an individual of the whole class of PFASs out there. And so uh, this is confusion. And there's uh, literally dozens of these on the market and they all look like different uh, firefighting phones by different companies and all of them say they'll work and they indeed do. But then to find this is a, a chem guard that is now making 
a, a like a white and I make a green bucket and it says F3 synthetic. That F3 stands for fluorine free foam. So that one is actually a good foam to use, whereas the one above is AR AFFF, Air, Air, Airport Rescue uh, Aqueous Foam Forming Foams, and that one is PFAS based. And how are you tell the difference? Because it doesn't say like this one says fluorine free. Forecheck made one that actually said fluorine free. Um, but, but here's another one that says AR synthetic. And you have to read the really fine print to find that that's uh, uh, for uh, fluorine free. And, but National Foam has come out with a very good product, I'm told, that actually extinguishes fires. And it is actively snowing outside. Isn't that wonderful? OK, um, we're going to go on. Um, so we did a study most recently of a 130 miserable firefighting foams where we found out what was actually being used. Um, we worked with the fire services, a bunch of in-service and retired fire chiefs that were actually went around and collected samples out of what was on the ground. Um, they collected from both fire stations and emergency management agencies that had stashes of these foams in the, in the, in the shed and shipped them to us in little containers and we just measured directly in the foam. We can measure liquids, it's just our sensitivity isn't as high. And we looked at what was had fluorine, which wasn't. And the real trick was, can the label be used to the classes are the correctly labeled, class B foams are, are bad. Um, and are the fluorine free ones actually free? We, uh, good news is that uh, the, with the total fluorine content, um, we were able to identify that the fluorine free foams were fluorine free, uh, if they had that label on them. Uh, there have many been tested in fire services, so they know which ones work better than others and why. Um, and the companies were all vying for that market, and more proud to them because they were fluorine free. Um, the AFFF that were not fluorine free, but were based on class B PFAS, were correctly labeled. If they said class B or class AB foams on them, they did have PFAS, 100% of them, uh, except for one that was really historic, as 1978 foam, it was even before uh, it had turned into AFFF. But for yeah, most of the foams we found, all of them were uh, labeled correctly. Um, there were no class A foams that were PFAS based, though several of them had trace amounts of fluorine in them, we think from a wetting agent or a manufacturing issue. Um, and if some of the fluorine free foams had trace amounts of fluorine still stuck in them, we think that's because they tried to make the same fluorine free foam in the same manufacturing equipment that had previously made uh, AFFF and switching between the two, it takes a while to clean out the tanks. And if they made fluorine free on the weekend and fluorine during the week, it didn't work out too well in the sense that there was still some trace fluorine in there. But still, it's clear that the industry is trying to produce fluorine free foams. I think there's a market for it. And the firefighter can get exposed to these foams um, but every time they're used. And so the fire services are learning to uh, take protective measures against using the foams. Certainly, no longer are they, are they cleaning it up in, without taking care not to touch it or to put it on hand to con skin contact or inhale it. Um, but a, it's coming late in the fire services. They've already used this foam for 30 years. But municipal fire departments don't use a lot of it, and yet their blood is still elevated in, in uh, PFAS often. There are several studies out that show uh, military firefighters particularly, but also civilians have elevated PFAS levels. And where are they coming from if it's not just the foam? I think it could be the foam practice uh, where they've practiced in the backyard and they put the foam down. They may not have been occupationally exposed at that time, but if they live in an area of like the Midwest where you've got glacial till soils and the, the water permeates quickly to the, the drinking wells, they could be drinking their own fire training pit water. And that's where my concern is with not just for the public, but also for the firefighters themselves. There's a wonderful story about a firefighter in Australia who they, they studied the blood of all the South Australian firefighters. And one of them was at 1600 parts per trillion in his blood. And the average is around five. Um, so he was twice as high as the next highest bloke on the, on the fire services. And they went out to visit him to see why he was getting uh, uh, such high. And he had used the phone, but not in two years. Um, so why was his blood level so high? And it turns out he was eating eggs. He was uh, doing a, a bodybuilding program with high protein diet. And his eggs were all organic because the South Australian fire services had encouraged the firefighters to stop eating pizza and start growing their own food, which they did. And they had a nice kitchen put in. He was eating five eggs a day. And the egg yolks were bioaccumulative from the chickens that were eating the wheat. And the wheat was grown where else but next to the fire training pit. And so it was bioaccumulating. And that led to a particular poisoning event of a firefighter 
who was alive and uh, asymptomatic at the time, but has since been treated to get his PFAS levels down. Um, so I think that there are lots of the takeaway messages that this foam can get to any which way. We should stop its use entirely, as we are doing, but the firefighters need to learn how to dispose of it and how to protect themselves in the, in the use of it. Um, and then I received an email from a spouse of a firefighter who was angry that her husband, shown here, Paul Carter, and Diane on the right, uh, had um, been a 25-year veteran of the, uh, the fire services. He had just taken his lieutenant's exam and was going to be promoted to lieutenant, and the following week uh, received a pro uh, prostate cancer diagnosis and was uh, out of the services at age 52, which is young. Um, and Diane was quite frankly upset. Um, she was angry that he could have been exposed to something. He took precautions and wore his PPE like everybody else, shown here on the left. Um, and she did some research on her own and discovered that these clothing were made watertight so that when you spray a hose, you don't carry, you have to carry 60 pounds of self-contained breathing apparatus to protect you from uh, breathing in the toxic fumes of fires. Uh, and heavy clothing and things like this. And if you get wet, you're now carrying a considerable more weight and the lifetime of a firefighter active in a, in a fire situation goes down as it gets wet. So they make the clothing waterproof. And what would you do to make water, uh, clothing very waterproof? You want the best they can have, uh, sure enough, it's fluorinated. And so we did a study where she sent us her husband's gear and it was fluorinated and highly so. And I asked the questions, is that all gear or is it just your husband's? Here. Um, if it doesn't come off, they're safe, but what happens if it came off? Would it be able to get into a firefighter? And those are the three questions I asked. And we've done a study now of, of dozens of sets of, of uh, gear that were sent to us by in-service retired firefighters. We uh, put it in the beam. You can see my student holding it there with purple gloves <clears throat> because we discovered that as soon as we started handling it, we could get fluorine on the hands from just handling the gear. Um, that's not good news. It does come off. Um, we found it was in all gears and it's required to be by the uh, fire, National Fire Protection uh, NFPA uh, uh, has a, a rule that requires the gear to be made in very similar fashions to be very waterproof and very effective in keeping the firefighters safe in a fire. Um, and so we looked at the different layers, there's three layers of the material, the outer shell, the, uh, the moisture barrier, and then a thermal layer in between. And uh, we found PFAS in all of them, uh, though not intentionally in the thermal layer, only in the outer shell and moisture barrier intentionally. Um, <clears throat> independent of what brand, all these jackets and pants were made the same way. Um, and typically the moisture barrier was made of Teflon and the outer shell had a side chain fluoropolymer. And the side chain fluoropolymer, <clears throat> Teflon is this long chain and you know, perfectly safe to eat, it passes right through you, it's too big to be bioabsorbed, but there are problems with, with uh, the polymers that we'll talk about next. But the side chain one caught our attention right away because there's published literature that shows that as you put Scotch Guard and the, the carpets in there, these, these chemically bound ones were bound by a, a, a point that wasn't made out of carbon and fluorine, and those points break, and they can be exposed to light or to, ox uh, to water, and that, um, this chain that's attached to a, a, a polymer chain can break off at this a structure point where there's a C instead of a, a CF, there's a CO. And that can break apart and loose the, the precursor to the FOA that comes off the outside of the jacket. And this precursor is a FOSA we observed in the materials that we, we extracted from the, cow, the material and also in the dust around the, the processing of these garments. And so we think that this represents an exposure source to the firefighters. We did, a, here's a whole series of, of tables where we were publishing now. Of, we found PFOA in all the dust that we looked at and all the extractions, except for the most recent uh, moisture barriers. But the most recent moisture barriers had something remarkable in this short chain. It's hard to tell the scale on the plot on the left, but the newest moisture barrier that had no PFOA, the one with a gap in the center of the picture, is the one with the highest level of PFBA. It's a C4 chain um, and it's uh, perhaps a hundred times higher than all the others because the newer moisture barriers have, have put more material in to make that, uh, since they removed P4 as the substrate for making Teflon, it was a solvent aid in the manufacture of Teflon back before 2012, you know, 2014 maybe in the good skier. Then they used a different PFAS chemical, a short chain in a C4, 
which passes through the body much quicker, months instead of years, and therefore is safe, quote unquote. But of course, if you wear a coat every day, it's not a one-time exposure and done. You're continually, every time you put the coat on, you'll be excreting this material the next day. Um, is that mean it's safer? I don't know. Um, I'm not a toxicologist, and I think that question is wide open at the moment. Um, I think the precautionary principle is that, um, yes, the gear comes off, we look at the new gear and old gear, and we see a loss of from the outer layer, about the same in the moisture barrier, and we see an increase in the thermal liner, so it, it goes up significantly on the thermal liner. Um, and so what we are going to do is urge our firefighters not to stop wearing their personal protective equipment. They have to. I mean, if you're going to go into a fire, you want to be safe. And this clothing keeps you safe. And that's the first message. But secondly, if we had clothing that was available without the fluorine coating, then that would have a, a better protective effect on the firefighter for uh, sources of, of cancer or a disease that firefighters, uh, you know, twice or three times the national average of, of cancer rates. Um, it's, um, so you'd like to protect them in all senses. You'd also worry a little bit about end of life. There's 1.2 million firefighters in this country and they each have two sets of this gear. Where does that gear end up after five or 10 years, but back in the landfill where over time, it's longer in this case, like 20 years, that it'll take for that, all that material to come off into the water supply. So the next hundreds of years, our, our landfills are going to be just shedding this material. Um, so, not to end on a negative note, but to say that the environment and our firefighters are, are two separate entities. Both affect us, um, both in positive ways, but also through this chemical, uh, they're all connected. And we definitely need for the, uh, for the education of the firefighters and the, the decision makers and the fire services, more clarity in label marketing and better education as to why this stuff is bad. There are plenty of companies out there telling them it's perfectly safe and don't worry about it. If it was good enough for your parents, it was good enough for you. Um, that's not necessarily true as we understand more about this particular type of chemical. Um, there's a serious need for end of life legislation and funding was for how to buy back foam and how to take care of these, this gear that's manufactured after its end of life. Um, and our direction is we're gonna make a much broader survey of both PFAS and consumer products and wastewater treatment plant outputs and figure out how we can see this quickly without doing a $300 or $400 test or an $800 test in the case of blood for the PFAS in these uh, individual tests. That's using the old technology. Our technology is a screening tool. We can do that much more cheaply. And our next generation of Piggy is actually to partner with a commercial um, a company, in this case, GE Healthcare out of, out of Sweden has a medical cyclotron that will allow us to expand from a, a 10,000 samples a year to 100,000 samples a year or more. And that will bring the cost down significantly. Though there's a capital cost to get the instrument, we can then screen everybody's drinking water. And if there's no fluorine, then there's no PFAS. If there is fluorine, we don't know which one it is. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter to me at this point. It's a cloth that we're trying to avoid in general. And then we can look for the sources quickly and then people can use the, the full test to identify which ones they are and look for health effects and things like that. So that's where we're going at Notre Dame. Um, I am glad to have spent ooh, 45 minutes already uh, talking about this. And so I'm going to open it up for questions and my email address is shown here. And I'm happy to take email questions as well. I've talked a lot of things very quickly. Um, you can replay that to YouTube apparently, but uh, if you're that bored, I've got other things you can do. Um, but I would be happy to answer questions at this point. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Graham. Um, Excellent presentation. I'll give you a couple of seconds to grab a glass of water or something if you want to. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to send them in either via the Q&A and Zoom um, or in the chat in YouTube, or you can use the Google Form link that I sent out previously, and I'll just repost that for everybody now in case you want to use that instead. Um, we've already had a few questions, so we'll, we'll get started on those to begin with. Um, we talked about these samples that you're, you're running. Can you just describe mm -hmm. those in a little bit more kind of detail? Are they like big samples, small samples? And you mentioned like liquids. So how can you kind of process those to, to get Very those good. measurements? Um, <clears throat> the samples we measure with the highest detection limit will be sal solid samples. So if we get a piece of paper, we need something the size of a thumbnail that will be about that size and a postage stamp 
we can put in the beam and we can measure directly. And so that it takes care of textiles, papers, often soils, we put them in a plastic bag and just put them right in front of the beam. And those are our individual samples. If you want to do drinking water, we need to go down to part per trillion levels. And our technique is not that sensitive. So we need to do an extraction. And this is a common chemical technique where you put it through a column and all the PFAS will stick to the surface of the column. <clears throat> and what we do is we, we cut the column in half and we put it sideways and measure the surface. And we can get a nice linear response. The more we put in there as a known standard, the higher response we get back. So we get quantitative how much fluorine there is there, uh, but we have to do an extraction on liquid samples. The firefighting foams are an exception because those are not at part per trillion levels. Those are between one, uh, half and 3%. Um, and that means that, that I <clears throat> can measure it directly in the liquid even, because my level of detection is more like a part per million there. And so we can measure that. We take a cup, uh, it's called an uh, X-ray fluorescence cup, which has a plastic uh, window, and we just turn it sideways and turn it sideways in the beam and measure it into the liquid directly. But that will only work at high, high concentrations. And, and so determining whether it's a PFAS foam or not is pretty easy. It's, it's um, you know, is that a tree or is that a car? It's pretty easy to distinguish. Um, when we're talking part per trillion and seeing the difference that uh, uh, that's that's where you need to have a, a pre-concentration step. And that's how we do liquids. Awesome. And we've had a couple of questions, actually the same question, one from Barbara and one from Jessica, which is, I, you know, mm -hmm. when you clean up these foams after using it, if it's the firefighters, how do you do that? <clears throat> and then how do you safely dispose of sort of PFAS once you've collected it, should we say? Mm. Those are two excellent questions, and I'm not sure anybody knows the answers to either, <clears throat> but I'll try. Um, if you have used PFAS as a firefighting foam, there are standard containment systems that they use. It's, it's like construction. They can build a silt fence around the construction zone to prevent soil from going away. They can put down a boom, on, especially on water. Since it lines the top of water, you could contain the foam, 90% of it, 99% of it, with a, with a simple boom over the water. If it's on, on ground, you could put a set of bags down and keep the foam on one side and not the other. You, uh, in, the, in the past, firefighters have said, well, there's this messy foam all over the runway, let's just wash it off. Well, nowadays they'd set a, a, a boom around the outside of it and wash it into a bucket. And not all of it would go in, but a good fraction would. Uh, if it's not on a tarmac and it's on cert, do, uh, dirt, then it's gonna go into the dirt. And a lot of testing was done on dirt with an unlined uh, fire training pit. So if they want to do a fire training pit and it was online, it all seeped into the ground eventually. And so that it's hard to undo that. And the military is spending lots of money trying to figure out how to. And it's there's the various soil treatment things, but all are expensive and it's much cheaper just not to use the stuff in the beginning as they're discovering. Um, the question of how to safely dispose of it is a much larger question because we have soils, we have groundwater, we have um, buckets of this stuff to dispose of. And there are two ways of disposing it. One is to put it in a deep hole for a long time and hope that it never gets back out. Um, I'm not fond of that because I don't know the sequestration. It's, it's expensive to keep it sequestered. Sequestering it is pretty easy. You can get a pump and, and treat system that will put it all into some charcoal. But then what do you do with all that charcoal? And uh, I think if it's incinerated above 850 degrees, a high temperature modern incinerator, which we don't use in this country very often, uh, but the military has used, for example, to get rid of the nerve gas. They did it on the Marshall Islands or wherever it was out in the Pacific, but uh, it, they burned it at high temperature and that gets rid of nerve gas. It will also get rid of PFAS above the 850, 1000 degrees. Um, those aren't very common and there are only a few in the US that can do this. Europe is much more common because they burn all waste that, that, that way. But if uh, I know that the state of Wisconsin found a contract that would take it to Wisconsin, Oregon, I think, where they had a high temperature uh, 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 system and it would burn. And then at that point, you break the carbon fluorine bond, you get free fluoride. And fluoride is inorganic and it will combine together with hydrogen to make hydrogen fluoride, which will dissolve in water and become inorganic fluoride very quickly. At high concentrations, that would be dangerous. But if you burn it in a smokestack, it'll come out as basically inorganic fluoride. And that's the same thing we use in toothpaste. It's perfectly safe. And so fluoride has got no known um, human or environmental worries, except at really high levels. Um, but uh, you can get uh, discoloring of teeth at high levels and things like that. But in general, fluoride is safe. And that's a, that's a very tough thing to say, right? Fluorine is unsafe or fluorine is unsafe, but fluoride is safe. Say that three times fast and get it right. It'll be good.
But just a quick follow up on that one. Was that 850 degrees yep. Celsius or Fahrenheit? That was Celsius, sorry. That's um, right. <clears throat> switching back and forth. It's uh, 12, uh, 1100 and some Fahrenheit, I'm sure. Okay, great. So there was a, another couple of questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So is there kind of a material or something that firefighters could wear under the router gear to act as a barrier to protect themselves? Yeah. Uh, this is, an, I only talked about firefighters in this talk, but there are lots of other textiles that are treated with this gear. And I'll just mention, we've got samples from everywhere and anything. Uh, flight attendants uh, wearing uniforms, uh, uh, menstrual underwear. Well, that's a really great place to put in the chemical. Um, and of course, the military. And so there are military doctors who are discovering that they're, they're, uh, they're treated not only with firefighting uh, PFAS, but they're treated with a, a um, anti-mosquito repellent, insect repellent, insecticide. And they're discovering this insecticide inside the blood of, of recruits uh, that wear the desert fatigues. Um, and so I know a medical doctor who's insisting that her soldiers wear uh, an undergarment under their fatigues, which is fine in winter in California. Um, it's not so good in the desert in the summer because they're wearing an extra layer. Same thing applies to firefighters. I think it would be very sensible, especially in the high absorption areas of the neck and the groin, to wear uh, as many layers as you can to protect yourself from uh, both absorbed chemicals and anything that might be on the gear from getting into the skin layer. Uh, we don't know how quickly it goes through the skin, but if I had to pick a chemical to go through skin, would I pick the world's best surfactant? Wouldn't be a bad choice. Uh, but we don't know how much goes through the skin yet. We're still doing that study. Um, but it's not zero. And so I think a protective layer would work, but there's just a trade-off between how hot can you stand the temperature for how long and what your, what your body does with that. And I don't want to advise people to do unsafe things. So I, I, I'm trying not to advise that. But I think the fire services are looking into that very question themselves. Is it prudent to do this? The best solution would be, of course, to make gear without PFAS. And there are other ways of waterproofing that will work. It probably won't work quite as well as a waterproofing agent. Um, it certainly won't work as a greaseproofing agent as well. But you generally don't fight in grease. You, you, the uniform might get dirtier quicker, but it will certainly be waterproof and be safe. Um, and there is, a, in fact, a textile recently produced that's an FDA compliant, 1971 compliant. And so I know that manufacturers are heading that way. It's just, it's, it's caught everybody off guard because everybody told them that, oh, this chemical is perfectly safe. Whoops. Um, they just made the gear and now they've got to reverse face and say, well, we now learn this is better to do it not without this, this chemical. And so I feel for the companies in the middle, but it's really going to be a process where the firefighters themselves are going to insist on getting the safest gear they can get as well as the least toxic. And I think that's where the issue, and, and the firefighters know very well how to assess risk. They go into burning buildings every day and I'm not going to define their risk for them. I'm going to define that there is a source that they need to be wary of and just that education is enough to start the questions. And the real studies are being done now by NIOSH, the National Institutes of Occupational Health and Safety. And because of the clamor that we've had over PFAS the last couple of years, some money has been freed up for a multi-million dollar study, which is what needed to be done. And some very good people are doing it. So I think the, that, that will confirm everything that this uh, independent person has found. And I think that's what, uh, what's going to drive uh, industry. They've got it now uh, to respond. And I think they will. Excellent. So I'm going to finish on a slightly light, lighter hearted question. Um, ah, very good. So you said you wouldn't microwave popcorn. So what's your favorite way of making popcorn? <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's very good for me. As you get older, popcorn is much healthier than French fries, I've discovered. Uh, so I will cut the bag open. Well, first of all, I get ticket, plane tickets to Denmark because they have fluorine free popcorn bags in Denmark. Um, and just recently, six years later, I imported them to the U.S., even though it's a U.S. company that makes them, but it's great. Um, uh, I would, if you can't get the Danish popcorn bags, um, then I would get, uh, cut the bag open and fry it uh, in oil uh, or hot air popper. Any, any of the old fashioned ways that you make popcorn would be fine. The microwave is great for reheating food, but it shouldn't reheat artificial chemicals that can get into your food or worse yet, into your garbage, which gets into your water. So, the, old ways are, um, the old ways are the best. Ah, uh, there you go. You, there we're you go. dating ourselves, Jonathan, but that's good. Anyway, thanks again, Graham, for, for taking us through that. Um, and if you are interested in seeing more about this, you can uh, find Graham's What You Would Fight For video. It's called Fighting to Protect the Brave. So you can find that on YouTube if you'd like to 
do it. Um, and as Graham mentioned, uh, this the recording of this talk and the past talks we've had will be on the YouTube channel. Um, it'll be up there in a few hours. If you want to go back and listen to anything again, you'll be able to do that. Um, next week, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, we're tackling a different topic on our universe revealed. Um, we are sort of moving away from talking directly about physics, but talking about something that's, I think, equally important that many of us who work in the field think about, and that's trying to have a diverse workforce. So I think many people understand and acknowledge the benefits of having a diverse workforce, um, both for businesses, companies, research, as well as sort of having equality for everyone who works in those environments. And it's particularly important in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that we do that. Um, there's been lots of strides to do that over the past few years, but there's still more work to do. And Dr. Michael Kilburn is going to be joining us next week to discuss that in a talk called Why Physics Still Lacks Diversity. So I hope you'll join us uh, next Tuesday for that at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time for that presentation. But in the meantime, thanks again to Graham. Thank you all for joining us. Stay safe out there and uh, hopefully see you next week. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>